Jeremiah chapter 33, 1 through 3. Just hear it out. While Jeremiah was still confined to the courtyard of the guard, the word of the Lord came to him a second time. And this is what the Lord says. He who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and established it, the Lord is his name. He said, verse 3, call to me and I will answer you. And I will tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Hold that thought. We're going to get back to it. What do you believe about prayer? Think about it. What do you believe about prayer? Do you believe that God actually hears us when we pray? Now I lay me down to sleep or thank you God for this food or dear Lord help my Aunt Susie because she's sick. Do you believe that he's listening? Do you believe that God answers prayer? Are other people's lives actually impacted when you pray or when someone else prays? Are there things that have happened in the world because someone prayed about it or things that didn't happen that might have happened because someone prayed to stop it? What do you really believe about prayer? That's just the looming question this morning I want to let sit with you. Does prayer really do anything? In my experience, I think the answer to all those questions that I just asked, and this is my experience, are yes, 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 yes. I believe in prayer. I believe that God hears our prayer. I believe God answers our prayer. I believe human lives have been changed because people have prayed. Prayer is a powerful thing. It's inviting the presence of God, uh, the, the, the hand of God into the scenarios in our life. And so I want to start this morning with just this kind of, uh, this phrase, this phrase, and I'm going to let you chew on it. I'm going to say it because I believe it. I want to encourage you to believe it, but this is the phrase, that when we pray, God shows up with exactly what we need. That's it. That's, that's the sermon this morning. <laughs> when we pray, God shows up with exactly what we need. Let's talk about that. We've been in this teaching series for a couple of weeks now called Sent to the City. And it comes from the mindset that, I mean, s- several of the last sermon series that we have gone through has been just in preparation in our minds because as a church family, we're about to do something that we've never done before. We're about to be in a building that we own on Sunday mornings. What does that do to our culture? What does that do to our church family? What does that do to our calendar? What does that do to how we actually do church together? Our leadership has been praying about that. Our leadership has been thinking about that. We've been talking about it, and all these sermon series and the different things we've been getting into have been trying to prepare our hearts for that place. And this, this idea is no different. We are sent to the city, and we talked about a couple different things. The first week, we talked about love where you live. You remember that? The idea of love where you live is not just like, love it because it's the beach and I can get a selfie, but love the people who live where you live. What does that look like? And we looked at the story of Nehemiah rebuilding a wall. It was a crazy look at like, what does it mean for us to get active and kind of rebuild some things in our city? The second week, we talked about Mary and Martha, but the big idea was this. Make the time to love people. Loving people takes time. And so you got to make it part of your routine. Last week we talked about grace. Do you remember we looked at the story of the woman with the alabaster jar and she's crying all over Jesus' feet and there's this really weird story where she washes his feet with her tears. What's going on there? But we asked the question, what does it take for us to love messy people? In fact, we took a step back and said, actually, uh, how dare we call anyone else messy? Because <laughs> we're all a hot mess. And so if we're going to be the church that's sent to the city, which I believe all of the church is, not just like our little community, but we're all sent to the people of the place where we live. What does it look like for us to love people where they are and have grace to bridge them through that? And so that's the idea. This week, like honestly, I don't know if you've ever had to write a sermon every single week of your life, um, but I do. And sometimes I get to a place where I'm like, I don't know what else to say. I, I, I'm lost. I don't know what else to say. But then it just hit me. When you don't know what else to say, you probably should shut your face. And you should talk to God about it. And so I had some other places I wanted to go with this series. But I, then I thought, no, I, I want to do something we've never done here before. Uh, you'll see in a minute that, that we're going to try it in, in just a minute. But th- the topic is prayer. We're just going to pray. But before we pray, which we are as a group today, uh, don't worry if you're really uncomfortable or you don't want to do this or you're a guest, there's stuff for you to do at that time too. But before we do that, I want to talk about prayer. I want to look at prayer because how dare we go into some great, you know, movement of our own without inviting the presence of God to it? How dare we go into someone's messy life and be like, I got you, without saying, Lord, bring your Holy Spirit into this situation, guide us, help us not make boneheaded decisions, help us to move where you want us to move and be still where you want us to be still. 
right? So that's our heart. That's our goal. So today's all about prayer. Uh, typically, we open up our Bibles, and we look at a chunk of Scripture, and I break it down, and we dig into it a little bit. We're going to get into that. I already read from Jeremiah chapter 33. We're going to look at a couple of other places. But before we get into that little section at the end, I want to take a second to just talk about how prayer has shown up in Scripture. And I made this, this uh, kind of assertion earlier that when we pray, God shows up with exactly what we need. But here's the thing. That doesn't mean God always gives us what we ask for. You see the distinction? Many times your child might ask for a brownie, but you're like, really what you need is some cucumbers and some broccoli. Like, this is what you need. And they might not even like what you give them, but you give it to them because you love them and you, you, you're doing your best to, to know what's best for them. And that's what God does for us when we pray, when we approach him. And so as you look through the scriptures, you find that God shows up after prayer, but it's often in like strange and crazy and miraculous and wonderful ways and sometimes a little bit mysterious. Go all the way back to the book of Genesis. Let's talk about a guy named Abraham. Maybe you've heard of Abraham. Abraham is the guy that God chose to be the forefather of the nation of Israel. If the Bible is divided into two big sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament, all of it is basically the story of Abraham's family tree, okay? And in the Old Testament, what we see is that family develop. And God comes to this guy. He's very old. He and his wife are both close to 100 years old. And he says, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And Abraham goes, that's great. But we don't have any children, so, and we're super old. And Sarah's like, no, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm past that time. But they talk to God about it. God blesses them with a child. And because of that prayer time, because of God's blessing, because of his providence also, but he shows up with exactly what they need. Now, it's a hot mess, if you know the story of Abraham. But through that process, God provides what the world needed. In this one child that grows into a nation. Fast forward the story a little bit more. You'll get into Genesis. You'll see over and over and over again where people are stepping in and asking God for very specific things and he shows up. But if you go even further to the next book of the Bible, the book of Exodus, you find a guy named Moses. Now Moses uh, is in a boat where uh, he is picked by God. By the time the, the Israelites, actually it's not even going to be Moses' story. It's really the Israelites that, that have a prayer. They are now a great nation, okay? They have become a, they're not super great. There's just a lot of them. The problem is the whole nation is enslaved. <laughs> they're slaves in Egypt. A lot of you probably know this story. And so they're in Egypt. They're all slaves. And it says that they cried out to God, come and rescue us. What is that? It's a prayer. That's a community prayer. The whole nation is like, Lord, deliver us. And so God comes to this guy, Moses, and there's a whole story there that I won't even get into. But God uses this guy, Moses, to come in, and he delivers the Israelites from their enslavement. It's a big, big deal. One of the most powerful men in the entire world, Pharaoh, is just kind of stumped because God shows up with miracle after miracle after miracle, and the Israelites are set free. And when we pray, God shows up with exactly what we need, but the things that begin to happen for this nation are crazy. Because first of all, Pharaoh just lets them go, okay? But then they hit something called the Red Sea. Do you know the story of the Red Sea? So they get to the Red Sea, basically, Pharaoh like releases them, they're like, okay, you don't have to be slaves anymore, and they all leave, there's hundreds of thousands of them, and then Pharaoh changes his mind. So when they get a little bit of a head start, Pharaoh sends his army after them and starts chasing them. And they're like, oh, shoot, there's an army chasing us. And we're not an army. We're former slaves. And they get to this big body of water called the Red Sea. Moses goes to God and says, okay, what do you want me to do? The Israelites come to Moses and they say, Moses, why did you lead us out here to die? We were better off back in Egypt. But through this communication with God, Moses understands, I want you to do something really weird. When you stand on the edge of the water, I want you to hold your walking stick up in the air, and I'm going to separate the waters. And if you've seen this story, you've seen the old Ten Commandments movie or the Prince of Egypt cartoon or whatever, like they walk across on dry land, like what? And not only that, but after they go on the other side, the waters close in on the Egyptian army, and they don't even have to fight them, and they win that. Now, is that not the craziest way to answer a prayer? I'm thinking like, I don't know, send in like some helicopters, or maybe just make the Egyptians forget what they were doing, and they turn around and go back. But guys, like, I'm going to divide. Now, here's the thing. I don't know if you believe in miracles like that. If you went over to the Cape Fear River, and I was like, dude, a couple thousand years ago, this thing split wide open and a whole nation walked across it. You'd be like, okay, you're crazy. But it's consistent with so many other stories we see in Scripture. God shows up with these amazing, miraculous deliverance pieces. Okay, so that's the Israelites. That's the Red Sea. If you continue reading their story, it's story after story after story where basically they hit a hard place and they go to God and cry out and they come to Moses and complain. So just a little bit later, they get to this place where there's undrinkable water. I think it's called bitter water. So they get to this bitter water place. There's hundreds of thousands of people with no drinking water. That's not good. Moses goes to God with it. He says, here's what I want you to do. 
it's this crazy story. You should go read it. He's like, I want you to take this like, piece of wood. I want you to throw the wood in the water. If you do that, the water will be sweet. Like, I don't know if it was like a big sugar packet that he threw in there. Like, I don't know what made the water from undrinkable to drinkable. Other than Moses' faith and God's provision, but God shows up with exactly what they need. So as you look to the Old Testament, you just see a lot of stories like that. It's like, what? that's not how I would have done it. But God shows up. Fast forward several more generations. You get to a guy named Elijah. Okay, Elijah is one of the great prophets of all time. And, and he's got this, the, the presence of God's spirit is in him in a major way. He's just part of a, some crazy stories. But Elijah finds himself in a battle. Now this is a time period where the king at the time is actually killing off the prophets of God. Strategically. Now you hear about this religious persecution in places like India and North Korea and, and China and stuff like that where people are coming in and, and like taking the leaders of the church and, and killing them. That's essentially what's going on here. They're taking the teachers, the prophets, the people who are kind of leaders of the community of faith and killing them. And Elijah finds himself as one of the few that are just kind of holding on. And he comes against this group of prophets of a demonic god called Baal, or Baal, B-A-A-L. 450 of them, one of him. And they're like, ha, so you worship this God of the Israelites, huh? That's kind of crazy. Look how many of us there are, how few of you there are. Obviously, we're better. He goes, oh, yeah, you think that's right? So he challenges them to this crazy prophet duel. <laughs> it's really cool. And this is essentially what the prophet, the, the, the duel is. This, this is the, the duel, okay? You know the story? Does anybody know the story? Okay, if you know the story, I want to change the story for you. The duel was, let's both pray. That was the duel. Now, you might know there's some other details. The terms of the prayer were this. We'll each build an altar. We're going to put an animal sacrifice on the altar. We'll each pray to our God. And whichever one uh, hears us will light the altar on fire and burn up the sacrifice. And then we'll know who has the true God. But essentially, what they're doing is challenge each other to a pray-off. So Elijah says, y'all can go first. <laughs> 450 prophets of Baal, when you read the story, man, these guys are going crazy. They are praying, they're screaming out, they're cutting themselves with swords to show their devotion to the God, and, uh, and guess what happens? Nothing. Nothing happens. Elijah kind of goads them a little bit. He's like, yeah, he's probably sleeping. Just louder, he's probably asleep, you know. The whole day goes by, and then Elijah goes, okay, it's my turn. But you, before I go, before I pray to my God, here's what I want you to do. Uh, this is the altar I set up, and I've got some sacrifice on it, and, but could you just dump some water on it? Because I don't want to make it too easy for my God. Just dump the water all over. Dig a trench around it. Put so much water on it so that it fills up the trench of water. Have you ever tried to light a fire with wet wood? I was camping with Boy Scouts on Friday night, and it had rained right before we got there. And uh, our poor guy, Cameron, like I sent Cam, I said, like, Cam, can you go start the fire? He's like, yes. <laughs> he got the fire started because he's a good Boy Scout. But it's not easy. I have friends who could hardly light a propane grill, like, and they have the clicker thing that lights it for you. Like, it's hard. But Elijah's like, I want to prove to you that this is no, uh, you know, smoke and mirrors he prays fervently to his God our God it says fire comes down from heaven and consumes not only the sacrifice not only the wood on the altar but all the water in the trench and the prophets of Baal are like dang <laughs> that's a paraphrase <laughs> when we pray God shows up with exactly what we need and um it didn't stop in the Old Testament. You get to the New Testament, I could go story after story after story. We spend a lot of our time on Sunday mornings. In fact, starting next week, we're starting a brand new series where we're just going through a series of Jesus stories so we can get to know our Savior some more. But people pray and amazing things happen. Sick people are healed and financial needs are met and prayers for protection are answered and all of this because people prayed. Now here's the thing, it's not just in the Bible that we see prayer answered. We see it in our contemporary life. Here, and now, since I've been a Christian, my life has been a continual stream of learning what it means to see answered prayer. And I've been confused more times than I can count. But I've also seen, seen things that are just incredible, and I've seen personally stuff happen in my life, uh, needs just being met. I can think of times when, like, my wife and I had a specific financial need, and then all of a sudden, like, a check literally shows up in the mail with, like, the exact amount we need. And you're like, What? And I, think, I know a lot of you have had some of those stories. Uh, I had a friend recently who was having some serious problems financially. Uh, it was a car issue. And then out of nowhere, they got a tax return that was like exactly what they needed. I think God works through tax returns. Um, I don't know what else the IRS is for, if not for God to be like. <clears throat> and these things happen. I can't, I, I'm trying to pick the number one story for that. But I decided to go back to maybe the first time I remember this happening. Uh, I remember being with a friend who had, she had destroyed her ankle playing basketball. 
and she was a senior in high school. She had a scholarship to go play softball uh, her freshman year of college, and um, she went to the doctor, and they were like, man, your, your, your ankle's destroyed. We're going to get you set up for now. You're going to have to come back maybe tomorrow. We're going to have you meet with a surgeon. We're probably going to have surgery. And basically, the long story short was like, you're probably not going to get to play ball in college. Like, you're probably going to lose your scholarship. Like, that's just what she was fearing. Now, I don't know what happened next exactly. Uh, I also don't know if God cares about girls' college softball teams or scholarship. I'm sure he has a position. <laughs> it probably depends on the person. But what I do know is that I was there when that girl came in and a bunch of people, faithful people, began to pray over her ankle. I'm a teenager, so I'm just watching this like, what's going on? And people laying their hands on her ankle and just praying and praying and praying and praying. And the next day she goes back to the doctor. The swelling had gone down considerably. The doctor starts looking at it, examining it. It's like, you sure we got the right x-rays yesterday? And they start checking it again. They do another x-ray and says, I, I don't think this injury is as bad as we thought it was. Uh, I think you just need to stay off it for a couple more days and you'll probably be fine. I can't tell you what happened. I can only tell you what I saw. <laughs> I'm the biggest skeptic in the world. If you told me a story like that, I'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, but what really happened? Like probably just coincidence, right? Like just bad equipment at the first time. I don't know. But story after story after that in my life, and the longer that I pursued God and the longer that I tried to put my own faith in prayer, the more I've seen that when we pray, God shows up with exactly what we need. But here's the thing I've got to say. It's not magic. Have you ever prayed for something and it didn't happen at all like you hoped it would? I've prayed for people who are sick or who have cancer, different things, and it didn't get better. I prayed for financial needs to be met in people's lives or people to find jobs and it didn't get met the way that we had hoped it would get met. And I know that this is a sticking point with a lot of people with their faith. Because God, if you're so powerful and you're so good, why don't you just fix everything all the time? You ever wondered that? I've wrestled with this a lot. I've said it in tears with more than one friend going, I don't know. And so here's, I'm gonna give you my, my, my synopsis, my teaching on what happens in those times? What's going on in the background? Okay, why doesn't God seem to show up with what we ask for? Why do some people not get better? Why do some needs not get met? Okay, this, you ready for this? I told y'all we should be writing notes. You're going to want to write this down. Here's the answer for, that I got. I have no idea. Just being honest. I have no idea why sometimes it doesn't work out the way that we hope that he does. But here's the other half. I say that in jest, tongue in cheek, because here's the other half of that answer for me. I also don't believe that God owes me an explanation for anything. How dare I go to the creator of the universe and be like, why? Gimme, 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 gimme. Because I think the God of the universe looks down at me and says, okay, I have bigger plans than you could know, okay? In fact, I think about what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 55, 8. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, but consistently, what I see is that maybe God doesn't always give us exactly what we want and what we ask for, but he shows up with what we need. What has he done about it? I think he has done some things about it. I, think, I can think of three things that he has done. Like, it's like, why didn't you fix this? Why didn't you answer this? What? He's like, well, I have done something. The first thing that I think he did was he came to earth <laughs> to get in the mess with us. See, as a result of sin in this world, there is a brokenness. It's a domino effect of brokenness. Our bodies were created to be perfect, but we're not perfect anymore because of the domino effect of brokenness. Families weren't supposed to always, they weren't supposed to be that we sometimes see them fall apart. They weren't. Things in this world should, I believe there is a tangible uh, result, a consequence of the spiritual fabric being ripped by sin. I can't put it into words, I can't measure it with a ruler, but if you don't see it, I don't think you've been paying attention. There's a brokenness in this world that's a result of sin. And so you know what God did about it? He didn't just come and say, I'm going to heal every cough and sniffle. Because what does that do for our faith? We're, we're, not, we're not eternal. Our bodies are not eternal. Our soul is. So what he said was, I'm going to come and fix your soul situation. So he came into the earth. That's the one thing I see him do. The second thing I see him do is that he's given us each other. You don't have to do this by yourself. You shouldn't. Loneliness is one of the plagues of our world right now. And it's hard. And that's why we have to be on our own side. I've got to actively be like, I've got to pursue community on my own. Because it's like, no one's going to come to my house and be like, hey, buddy, 
You're not doing a good job at community. Let me help you get out there. I know you're introverted, but uh, we're going to do this. Like, no, those people are dealing with their own issues. So it is on each of us to step out and try to make friends. But also, it is also on each of us to be that person who says, hey, you okay? Can I help you out? Can we grab lunch? Can we get coffee? Can we talk? I heard this or thought that. So he came into this world, and, and he didn't leave us alone. He left us with each other. And then the third thing that he gives us, and he gives us full circle, he tells us we can talk to him. He invites us to pray. He said, I am listening. I'm here. And I care. Get it off your chest. We are given permission to speak to God. So Jeremiah chapter 33 that I started with is just one of those. I wish I could dive into the whole Jeremiah story. Um, but in Jeremiah 33, there's just some stuff going on. Let's read it again. While Jeremiah was still confined in the courtyard of the guard, the word of the Lord came to him a second time. This is the second time God spoken to him. Sometimes prayer goes both ways. He's talking back to us. This is what the Lord says. He who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and established it, the Lord is his name. This is what he said. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things. He says, hey, Jeremiah, it's me, God. Maybe you heard of me. And I love how he kind of gives himself some credentials. He who made the earth, the Lord who established it, the Lord is my name. Like, that's great. And he's like, oh yeah, I've, I've heard of you. I'm a prophet. Call to me and I will answer you. And I will tell you great and unsearchable things. So, in just a couple minutes, what's our takeaway? I think that this little passage in Jeremiah teaches us three things, like incentives to pray. And this is what I want to do this morning. I want to tell you those. And then I want to actually invite us to have an active prayer time right now. A um, handful of you already know that I'm doing that because I've told a bunch of you. Some of you might not know. Uh, and I want you to prepare your heart to just think about what is it I want to talk to God about. No one's going to make you get on a microphone or stand in the light or anything, but just have an opportunity to do this because I don't think we do it. We don't, we don't pray. We're not good at it. What are the three incentives to pray we learn from the Jeremiah passage? The first one is this. He says, call to me. He gives us an invitation to pray. Number one, he invites us. Call to me. That invitation is the same thing that Jesus echoes, by the way. If you think, well, he was talking to Jeremiah. He wasn't talking to me. Well, Jesus says it. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find it. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. He's just saying, look, I'm a good father and call on me. So the first incentive to pray is that we're invited to do it. Like it's one thing to know that you have a friend who has a swimming pool in their backyard. Like that's cool, good for you. You got a swimming pool. Maybe they'll invite me over sometime. That'd be nice. It's another thing for them to be like, hey, I got a pool. Call me anytime if you want to use it. You, you see the difference? Especially if they're even so far to say, listen, I got a pool, here's the thing. The gate's open, just shoot me a text, let me know you're coming, I'll let you know if it's inconvenient for some reason, but it's just yours to use. Like, that's a beautiful invitation, and that's what God's saying. He said, listen, I'm just here, the gate's open. I've got all the power in all the universe, I created it all. Call to me. And then the second incentive is the next sentence, and I will answer you. He promises to answer. Now, this is frustrating if you've ever prayed and the thing you prayed for just didn't seem to happen. You really answer me? Here's food for thought. This is if you have like a small group time later or a devotional time later. This is the question. Someone asked the other day, it's been blowing my mind for like two months. Is that when can you tell when God is at work? Like how do you know? How do you know that God is at work? Because we're real quick to give him credit when it's like, hey, I got a raise and everything's going good and the kids don't have any cavities and there's no commercials in the game and it's like, it's a great day. God's at work. But like when things are hard, we're like, oh God, where are you? Where are you? I can't find you. I can't see you. I can't smell you. I can't taste you. I don't know what's happening, God. I'm so lost. You think God quit working? That's just food for thought. I love creating the space for us to battle with those thoughts because how can you tell when God is at work? Call to me and I will answer you. And sometimes it takes years. For Abraham, it took decades. My conviction is that God is always at work. Call to me and I will answer you. And then the third part is this, call to me and I, and I will answer you. And I will tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. This is cool. I wish I was smart enough to explain it. <laughs> but they're great and unsearchable and I do not know them. <laughs> Because the number of times, and I just wish like, I don't know, one day maybe me and my wife can just sit here and tell y'all stories about the last 10 years of our life. <laughs> we moved here and didn't know anybody. We had a few friends, like acquaintances, but we weren't like in great 
close community with anybody in Wilmington. We knew God was calling us to be part of a new church work. And there were times when I didn't want to get out of bed because I was so depressed and scared and nothing was happening. And we didn't know what was going to happen with our finances because I quit my job somewhere else and came and did this. <laughs> and there's so many times where I was just like, Lord, I'm crying out like the Israelites. Come and deliver me from this, this thing that I did. Was, did I make the wrong decision? Look, I, I never want to like try to say anything we did was harder than anybody else did, okay? But I will say for me, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. But then time after time after time, we'd look and be like, oh, wow, that's not how I would have done it. We would have thrown the, the wood in the water to make it sweet. Don't know why that happened, but, you know, we, we, we gave away hot dogs at a park and, like, we met some new friends. <laughs> wow. I, I'll never forget the first time I met with a, a, a couple of people. I think there were six, six or eight people. We just went to a Zaxby's. There were just some people I met, like, through random things in town. Like, hey, you want to meet at Zaxby's? And then they showed up, and there was other people there that they didn't know because they were our friends. I was like, okay, here's the thing. So here's, uh, we're... We were thinking about like starting like a Bible study. I just wanted to know if y'all wanted to be part of it. They're like, oh, Zaxby's? Like, you want to do this at Zaxby's? Like, <laughs> what's going on? But like, I didn't know what to do. But the great and unsearchable things that God has shown me as I've just trusted him has been mind-blowing. And I know that a lot of you have those same stories. Call to me and I will answer you. And I will show you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. My ways are not my way, your ways. My mind is not your mind. The more I rely on God, the more I trust him to be my guide, the more I see that talking to him makes a difference. And he shows up with exactly what I need. My heart is that as a church family, we will be a church family that prays. That first and foremost, when we, I mean, look, we we have this slogan, church for people who don't like church, right? What does that even mean? Well, we've said it a thousand times. It means we want to tear down the walls that have kept people away from God so that we can build bridges to Jesus. And, and sometimes in our mentality, I know I've been guilty of this and I go back and forth on it, is that sometimes that means stripping away some of the basic things that make our faith what it is. Well, what if people don't want to pray? What if it's uncomfortable? What if they don't know what to say? What if they've had bad experience with prayer? And you can't strip away the, the heart of it, the lifeline. We can't strip that away. We can't strip away worship. We can't strip away communion. We can't strip away baptism. We can't strip away teaching from scripture every week. None of that can be stripped away or what are we doing? Guys, we've got to be a church that prays. And if, you, and, if you, and if you struggle with prayer, then join the club. I'm with it. But I have found that the strongest spiritual discipline I have right now is prayer. <laughs> because sometimes I don't have any idea what else to do. We just sit in my heart with God and say, Lord, just help me know. And I'll tell you this. Just like my, my wife and I, we're about to celebrate uh, 20 years of marriage. When we first started dating, uh, we probably weren't great at communication. We're basically like, yeah, you're cute. I think you're cute. Cool. We're in love. <laughs> that was incorrect. <laughs> Except for the cute part. Um, but the longer we spoke to each other, the more we understood each other's hearts. And the more I can understand when I'm going the wrong way or things aren't going well. And that, that's how prayer works too. But you just got to do it. And if you want a magic dart that fixes it in one day, I'm sorry. You're, you're, you're in the wrong group. Faith takes time. But don't give up on it. So we're going to pray. My heart is that we pray like this. Philippians 4, 6 says this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, and with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the second verse says, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When we, when we submit ourselves in prayer to God, his peace begins to overtake us. Every week we try to have a time where we just uh, respond to what God's doing in our lives. And what I want to do is add something this week. We always do communion and other things, but I want to add a time where we just pray together. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to have a prayer with us right now. The band's going to come up on stage. They're going to get a little sound going because we're Americans and we can't stand silence. But we're going to get a little sound going so you get your head in a good spot. And then I'm just going to walk us through a little prayer time together. My hope is that when you get up, a lot of you are going to probably get up and do communion and do other things, that you'll try to gravitate towards a group of three to five people. You do not have to speak out loud and pray out loud with a group of people today. You don't have to do that. No one's forcing you to do that. But I hope that once you get in a group, you will kind of uh, elect a leader. <laughs> and who's going to be a leader in our group? And just kind of be the person who guides some time. I'm going to give you two or three prompts. 
and encourage you to just talk about it and then maybe one person pray. And then if in that time you have other prayer things you want to bring up, you can pray about that. Uh, And I'll, I'll walk you through that in just a second. But let me just start by beginning this time with prayer. Will you join me? Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the peace that you give us and the grace knowing that we are not good enough all the time. We're not perfect enough ever, but you are sufficient for our needs. You always give us what we need. And Lord, I pray a prayer of healing over my heart on the times when I prayed for things and I didn't feel like I saw anything different happen. But also let me be humble enough to know that you don't owe me an explanation. You are God. Allow me to step into your presence and just know that you love me. And you show me your love through Jesus and you show me your love through this community and you show me your love by just inviting me in. And I pray over the next few minutes that as we lift up our hearts and our voices that this would be a new thing in each of our hearts that, we're, that we will, like if we want to tear down the walls that have kept people away from God that one of the walls we tear down is our own, um, like the mask that we wear. That we put between each other and that we put between ourselves and you. We'll just tear that down and we'll say, Lord, you help Like the Israelites cry out, deliver us. God, you are good. We love you so much. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So at the end of our teaching every week, we have a chance to respond. And so what I want to do is open up uh, first talking about uh, if you're here today and maybe you're a guest or you're just taking some very first steps in your faith today. You're just here. You're like, oh man, I showed up on group prayer day. Um, to know it's okay this is a safe place and whatever's about to happen you're welcome to just stay in your seat as a response no one's gonna look at you and be like what are they doing (laughs) no we're actually just celebrating that you responded in that way and i want to encourage you that maybe you tried to pray just from your seat lord i'm here uh help me (laughs) if that's why you came also we'll have communion available there's uh, stations to my left my right and in the rear and you might want to go there first this communion is a, is a reminder uh, this coming uh, Friday Good Friday is our annual celebration of this thing we do every week through communion which is when Jesus sits with his closest followers and he has a meal with them and he breaks bread and he says this is my body and it's broken for you and he prays over it and he, and he takes the, uh, the juice they have wine, we use grape juice but he says this is the fruit of the vine this is my blood, it's being poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins and so we have this these emblems that remind us of that big first step that God took, you know, to come into our lives and give us connection with him. So I want to encourage you, if, if you do communion, if you want to try communion, go to the stations there, have communion. There's a little trash can right by the table if you want to throw away your cup, or you can kind of do it at your own pace. But then from there, if you want to be bold, if you want to be crazy and brave, just gather with a group of people. Two, three, four, five. Probably more than five is going to be a lot and it's hard. And just, we're just going to hang out here for a minute. Um, There's time. And I want to invite you to kind of elect a leader amongst your group. If you're just that go-getter person that says, I'll do it. Just do that because most people are not. Say, I'll do it. So uh, let's begin by allowing us to go to a time of communion. So if you're a Venture Church regular and you want to break the ice so it's not awkward for any of our guests, make your way to one of these communion stations. And let's just begin a time of reflection and prayer.